Welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Dr. Anna Wasesha, President of Middlesex Community College, and joining me today is Carolyn Kirsch. And we're going to be talking about a play that will be staged here at the college on April 5th called Are You Now or Have You Ever Been? Uh, and then I'm guessing that we'll probably talk about lots of other things as well. But let's start with the play. So can you introduce yes, it to the listeners? of course. This play was written by a man named Eric Bentley. It's actually not a play. Eric Bentley wrote a book in 1971 called 30 Years of Treason, which dealt with the excerpts from the hearings before the House Committee on Un-American Activities, uh, HUAC, as it's also known, which went from 1938 to 1968. From that book, he refined down transcripts which were connected with the investigations of show business by the Un-American Activities uh, Committee, which went from 1947 to 1958. The play is actually a compilation of transcripts. There are no written words by the so-called playwright Eric Bentley. The words that the audience hears are actually the words of the people who were subpoenaed and brought in front of the committee. And once you were subpoenaed, uh, you were pretty much labeled a communist in the country, unpatriotic, un-American. And it's a very powerful piece, and what interested me when I went to New York in the 60s, the generation before me, you know, they were talking about this. You know, there was the book and the committee hearings. And when the play came about, I never forgot it. I never really got it off my mind. And recently, with with the climate in the country about Muslim Americans, more and more people have been connecting this kind of uh, generalization about an entire population, as indeed in the 50s they were calling people communists. Now, uh, I'm rambling here a bit, but there is a committee, Peter King, the representative from New York State, and it, he is chair of the House Homeland Security Committee, in 2011, uh, they began an examination of the extent of radicalization in the American Muslim community and the community's response. So there are people being pulled in front of this committee. There is a parallel here somehow that, we, um, that we're interested in and watching in the interest of history not repeating itself. The House uh, Un-American Activities Committee hearings were uh, a blight in our history. And we certainly don't want to make the mistake of history repeating itself uh, against another population. Exactly. And I wonder, we have to take a break. Mm -hmm. But if we, when we come back, let's talk about some of the long-term impacts of the HUAC committee hearings and what that Absolutely. did to American culture. Absolutely. Welcome back. This is Anna Wasesha, and I'm talking with Carolyn Kirsch today about a play that will be here at the college on Thursday night, April 5th, from 6.30 till it's over. 8.30, 8.45, something like that. And we're going to talk some more about the play, because it's, it's really, in my mind, it's also a reader's theater. It's staged in a different kind of way, so it's a different mm -hmm. approach to theater. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the source of it are these transcripts from the House Un-American Activities right. Committee. And also we're going to have some discussion and a few other things. So why don't you go through that evening from 6.30 right. on? Uh, this is actually being put on by the Vintage Players, which is a group founded by Jane McMillan in 1993, and they've done uh, 17 productions over the years. And uh, we do work many times with script in hand and do staged readings so there is movement but people have have the privilege of having their scripts in hand and don't have to memorize when we do uh, short productions for a short amount of time but we have been memorizing productions lately so uh, we're moving along with that yeah, you're the movement. director right I am the director right. yes so continuing on with what uh, was going on with these investigations the committee was going after the Writers Guild of America, the Directors Guild of America, the Screen Actors Guild of America. People that were blacklisted became very famous. Hundreds and hundreds of people were blacklisted, ruining careers. Uh, there were suicides. There were just uh, an incredible amount of difficulty and pain and havoc created by being called in front of the committee. Some of the people were uh, Ring Lardner Jr., Larry Parks, Abe Burroughs, Elia Kazan, Jerome Robbins, Lillian Hellman, Lionel Stander, Zero Mostel, whom I had the privilege of working with at one point in my career. And Zero still had a great deal of 
anger about having been blacklisted, even though he did rebound and had an incredible career after that, as we know, but never really lost that feeling of pain and anger over having been blacklisted. Paul Robeson, Orson Welles, Burgess Meredith, Gypsy Rose Lee, because of her affiliation uh, and an affair, quite frankly, with Paul Robeson when they were doing Othello. And my acting teacher in New York, Uta Hagen, was also blacklisted. So it, it was a horrible time. Some of the, pe the people who cooperated with the committee and did name names, because the committee always wanted you to admit that you were a communist, and then they wanted you to name names of people that you had been to meetings with. So it just snowballed and had a great domino effect. Sterling Hayden eventually did cooperate with the committee and um, as a result went on to have a good career after he was allowed to work, go back to work. Ilya Kazan, Jerome Robbins both cooperated, uh, which made it very interesting for Zero Mostel working with Jerome Robbins on Fiddler on the Roof after that. That was not an easy time, I'm sure, for either one of them, having been on opposite sides of what they had done in front of the committee. And Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. um, cooperated with the committee. I was waiting for you to get to him. Mm -hmm. But as you were yes. reading the list, those are so many names we recognize, but also so many of them were Jewish. Yes. And this is just right after World War II had ended. Yes. And um, how horrifying, in a way, to extend that kind of persecution of people for... Absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. Yes. No question about that. Right. The Jewish community was highly suspect and condemned for their more liberal policies and were accused of using their art forms to further their liberal policies only and got caught up in this. So before the break, I was wondering if we could think about what the long-term ramifications of this kind of, of action on the part of the government is what they are, what the ramifications are, I guess. So art, I would say artists in the last couple of decades have taken enormous chances with their art, and some of them have received a lot of public scorn and retribution as a result. So that's mm -hmm. certainly happening. More and more, we live in an international community of artists. So one wonders what artists in other countries think of our art scene and how our government and um, and possibly also the just the power elements in our society, large corporations, for example, who give, who are philanthropic and they can provide support to certain groups, but then if they withdraw it for a reason or if they decide to distribute it in a way that, you know, does tell you what their value system really mm -hmm. is. So where, where do you think the, like the strongest example of the negative impact of the United States government having basically spent 30 years persecuting in uh, many people, they weren't just artists, but many people mm -hmm. for, um, these, you know, for, it, to some degree, I think exercising their their freedoms in mm -hmm. this country to, to have political persuasions that weren't part of the majority party. My feeling uh, would be that one of the most negative um, aspects of a situation like this is that you lose so many great creative minds and people may become intimidated about continuing with the work that that is inside them and, and longing to come out and be realized. So there's always that possibility that people will just drop out and can't handle that. Of course, there is the funding that, you know, the artists are always trying to scramble for arts funding and in order to keep projects up and running and going. So financially, emotionally, impetus-wise, you know, it becomes very difficult to thrive in a climate like that. What I find hopeful, however, is that when people are passionate about their arts, you really can't stop them in many cases. They are going to continue to move social causes forward and listen to their own voices as to what they have to offer. Uh, I work with young people, high school age, uh, teaching a lot, and I see that even these students, are they're bright, they're erudite, they are socially committed, and I have great hope that they are continuing to move the arts forward as far as social causes. They're not frightened of it, which is great. That is good. But I also think that a play like Are You Now or Have You Ever Been is important for young people to see as well so that they do learn from this historical perspective and know that there are pitfalls out there that they may have to surmount. Right, right. And to some degree, how important it is for artists to ally with artists, um, mm -hmm. as well as with the general society, mm -hmm. so that they aren't alone mm -hmm. in this work. I mean, I think after World War II, there must have been tremendous 
trepidation about the eruption of social change in this country. I mean, mm-hmm. for example, Truman integrated the troops mm-hmm. at the end of the war, and 16 million people who were part of that military culture were coming back into this country and having to be acculturated. Women had stepped forward into lots of roles of, you know, productive economy, and uh, and then, you know, were asked to go back into the house and, and play the stereotypical role of the wife and mother. We Many, many more people uh, who had lived in the rural areas were moving to the city, so the cities were changing in, in big ways. Uh, and so as I think about that, uh, and, the why, and why I brought it up is, to some degree, all of the anti-Muslim sentiment that we hear, including this morning in the paper, that there were two southern states where there are going to be primaries soon, where, where the voters believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim, yes. uh, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Right. So is this an equally frightening time in the sense that the way that we've seen the world operate isn't going to continue to operate that way much longer? Our societies are vastly more diverse. The economy is, even the base of our economy is shifting. And so uh, we talk about the the knowledge economy, but we also see this huge divide between, this is the 99% right. thing, the, between right. the very wealthy and then the, the rest of the folks. Mm-hmm. And uh, federal budget and the state budgets are no longer really sufficient to uh, to create the safety net that we used to depend on so much for people so that we could hope that that rising tide would you know, that, that they would be lifted along with the rising tide of the economy. So I think we have all the more. I mean, I, I'm so glad you're doing this play. It's important that we shed light on these issues. Uh-huh. And the nice thing about theater is that you can do it in an inter- entertaining way as well mm-hmm. as an academic way. Mm-hmm. Not that academics are not entertaining. <laughs> they should be, right? <laughs> they should. But to have people come into a dance concert or to a theatrical production and yet walk out with their thoughts having been jostled up about an issue, I think is a very valuable thing. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have to take another break. Uh, And when we get back, let's keep talking about art for social change. Well, welcome back. This is Anna Wasesha from Middlesex Community College, and Carolyn Kirsch and I are talking today about Are You Now or Have You Ever Been, which is a play which will be produced here on campus on Thursday, April 5th, starting at 6.30. And in that discussion, what we're also talking about is art for social change, because all art, in a way, does promote social change. I saw the film Anonymous the other day, and I was so amazed because it's about uh, whether or not Shakespeare actually wrote all the Shakespearean plays. That's the mm-hmm. kind of the setup. And in this film, they suggest that a Southampton, I think, who was, who was a perhaps the illegitimate child of Queen Elizabeth, was the author of the plays, but he couldn't produce them under his own name because the Puritans would not allow any engagement with anything like literature. It was considered mm-hmm. sinful. And mm-hmm. I had really not thought much about the Puritans but certainly that means that even during the Renaissance, people were, you know, the plays were, and, were and they were they kept shutting those plays down because mm-hmm. they were obviously awakening among the regular people mm-hmm. this interest in the world's affairs. So mm-hmm. y- you have some examples of theater productions, right, over time that have done the same kind of thing. Well, I do. I mean, uh, if you go back to 1927, the musical Showboat changed I, the face of American musical theater, and it opened with Norma Terrace as Magnolia. We have the Norma Terrace Theater in Chester. Oh. So, but it dealt with miscegenation and the plight of the black dock workers. And there was a very, very interesting production in 1937, we were talking about funding the arts, uh, called The Cradle Will Rock, which was done by the Federal Theater Project. It was directed by Orson Welles. It was a pro-union musical. And the federal endowment at that time decided that they did not want this put on, and so they padlocked the theater. The, the actors rented another theater, but the funding apparatus had said that they could not s- step on a stage to do this production. So they, they put a piano in an aisle or something, and the actors were all seated out in the house, and uh, Mark Blitzstein, the composer, was playing the music and telling the story of it to an audience who did show up, and the actors would stand and sing. And the entire musical was done that night. So that's an example of a remarkable example. Social. Mm-hmm. The group theater went from 1931 to 1941. Clifford Odets came out of that, Waiting for Lefty. Social, they dealt with the American plays of social significance. I am from the musical theater world. For me, it's uh, South Pacific, dealing with breaking down racial barriers. You've got to be carefully taught to hate and fear, which uh, the producers wanted to cut from the show when they were out of town. And Rodgers and Hammerstein said, we will close the show then, we will not open. 
they insisted that that song be in there, which has become an iconic mm-hmm. uh, piece of American musical theater. West Side Story. Of course. You know, Cabaret did a lot as far as informing people about what was happening in uh, neo-Nazi Germany. So there, you know, The Grapes of Wrath, Injustices of Migrant Workers, uh, there's so many examples of theater pushing the envelope to get the issue out there in front of people. Yeah, and imagine a world where that didn't happen. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I was thinking, you see so much uh, in film and in, and in the theater about gays. And it seems to me, it, and in television, and regular network television, there's so much clear acceptance of gays mm-hmm. in our society. Mm-hmm. And yet there's, you know, we, we have to be constantly vigilant because they're, and, we, and obviously they still don't have equal rights before the law when it right. comes to marriage and things like that and, and uh, health care benefits because they, they aren't, they, mm-hmm. rec- the unions are not recognized. Right. And, you know, you wonder, I wonder how long is it going to take our government to catch up with the people? Because the people, in my mind, have got a lot of this sorted out. And you, know, you see it expressed in, it, in arts. And it is interesting. I have a, a younger friend uh, in her 40s who feels that the gay mov- movement is not moving quickly enough. And yet, I'm approaching 70 here. So I go back so many more years, and I do say to her, I do see things moving a lot quicker than when I was growing up and just becoming aware of the issue of being gay. And things were not moving as quickly as they are now, and yet I know that it is still very, very slow for people who are living this lifestyle and having to compromise. Right. And that's another issue that we're all in the theater, working on, bashing away at, uh, in order to get uh, equality. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm just smiling because there are an infinite number of social issues that the theater really has addressed from the beginning of time, mm-hmm. since the choruses of ancient Greek theater, right? Yeah. So, so let's go back to our own history of uh, identifying and suspecting individuals of being really counter to the government, of being treasonous. When we do this play here at the college, there's going to be an opportunity both to hear beforehand and then to discuss after Mm -hmm. how people are reacting. So in the beginning, before the play, what will we hear? Uh, Richard Kamens, who is well known in the community, will do some introductory remarks about the play. And then I have a two or three minute clip of uh, the representative from Minnesota, Mm -hmm. your home state, Mm -hmm. right? My home Um, state, that's right. Keith Ellison, who is uh, wonderfully eloquent and was our first Muslim American to be elected to the U.S. Congress. We now have two. And interestingly enough, uh, Representative Ellison took his oath on a two-volume Koran, which was published in London in 1764 and was once owned by Thomas Jefferson. Isn't that perfect? Which I love, you know. (laughs) So we will run, he, when this uh, committee was called by uh, Peter King, Uh, to examine Muslim uh, radicalization, Keith Ellison requested to make a statement in front of the committee. And we are playing a portion of that for the audience here at uh, Middlesex Community College, in which he, he, um, again, is wonderfully eloquent, but does uh, emotionally break down. And it's very poignant and very heartfelt to watch this wonderful statesman struggling with this issue of what he sees happening uh, to, you know, people that he loves and uh, in this country. Right. To, and to American citizens. And to American citizens. Uh, who Correct. Who should be able to practice whatever right. religious beliefs. Have. First Amendment. Exactly. First words. Right. Freedom of religion. Right. You know, so... For me, it's, it's, uh, I don't relate to America as being a one religion country. I didn't grow up relating to that. I feel that uh, we are free for all religions to thrive and to uh, be honored and respected. So that's where my heart really got involved in bringing this piece of theater to life again. And, and then following the play, there will mm-hmm. be time for... For question and answer, which uh, we love to have lively discussion. So that would be wonderful if uh, people bring their questions and uh, yeah, let's discuss it. That's that's one of the purposes here. Exactly, I, and I really thank you for bringing the play to the college because thank you. This is um, 
what we want our students and our faculty and staff to be doing is engaging with the big questions of our time. Well, it's very exciting that you've invited us. Thanks. Well, as, as we come to um, the end of the program, I thought it would be very interesting to hear from Carolyn about how she set out on a path in her life, brought her to the point where now here, in, having been in Middletown for 21 years, she's working with the vintage players, and she's she's producing a play that has a very important social message. So it's uh, art, but it's art for social change. So how, how did you get launched on that path? Background-wise, I grew up in the South at a very difficult time. Where in the South? 50s, Pensacola, Florida, and New Orleans. Oh my in heavens. between those two towns. It explains a little bit of the lilt in your language. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Even as uh, a teenager, I realized that something was radically wrong with, with what we were doing as far as uh, racial equality. And when I moved to New York, I went to New York. I became uh, a dancer on Broadway. I did 15 Broadway shows over a 21-year period and was very much a part of uh, the Broadway community, which is uh, a, socially, a social issues active community. I think between those two things, having dealt with what I was dealing with in the South and then being thrust into a much more liberal society that I related to and loved, has really informed me all along in my career. I love to do, I love to do productions that, are, that have something to say. I mean, um, in April we're doing uh, Driving Miss Daisy at Green Street Art Center, which has wonderful things to say about not only race but age and how we deal with it or not deal with it. These things are now interesting me more and more as opposed to doing lighter things. I love comedy, don't get me wrong. I do love comedy. I think there's a great place for it in this world. We need to laugh. That's important. But I also love doing these socially relevant uh, productions as well. It's great to get to a point in your life, I think, where you can look back and see mm -hmm. see changes that's happened and also figure out how you can make a difference. And these kinds of theater productions make a difference yeah. in the lives of the audience. Yeah. When, I, when we first did this, Are You Now or Have You Ever Been?, I realized that I wasn't just sitting in my rocking chair at home and grousing about the situation. I was actually standing up in front of people and saying, I think this is wrong, and this is why I think it's wrong. And that gave me a real sense of empowerment. Uh, f really for one of the first times in my life about theater because I was now standing in front of people and saying, let's do something about this instead of just complaining about it. Exactly. I understand that you uh, at various times have taken courses here at Middlesex Community College and every time I run into you, you say you've had some really wonderful experiences in the classroom. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing a few stories about what it was like to be a student here. I have indeed, and I've taken random courses in, at Hunter and in New Jersey and all around in, in my lifetime, but two of the finest professors that I had were here at Middlesex Community College. Uh, Steve Kravisky in the math department uh, was a joy because I am not good at mathematics and he made it fun for me for the first time in my life, uh, and Richard Patrick for sociology, which I could not believe how much I learned by being able to work with open book for testing because he put one question on the board and the thought processes had to be there or you would be floundering. So he really made you think they both did. So I, I had a wonderful experience with my courses here. I'm, I love to hear stories like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, I love sociology. And Richard Patrick also talks about Southeast Asia and Asia, and, and those are immensely interesting to me. But, Very dynamic teachers, both of them. Uh, but I have to say, in the area of math, there's nothing like an extraordinary math teacher to try wow. to take the edge off some of the previous experiences so many people have had with math. And Steve can yeah. make it. Up. Yeah, I hadn't had math since I was 14 years old and had ha struggled through algebra, cried every night over homework. And I looked forward to going into Steve's class. Wow, so that's a real testament. That's a major yeah. change. <laughs> so all of those of you out there in the, in the listening community who have anything that we used to call math anxiety, uh, but realize now that if without math you can't make it in this world, you should come up here and take a course from Steve Kravisky, who is still on the faculty. Richard Patrick teaches occasionally, but he's sort of semi-retired. But mm -hmm. Steve is here. And uh, as many people who, uh, who know him know, he's a baseball fanatic, too. Yes, he so is. So there's a whole other side to yeah. him that's really great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming over to talk to me here today at the college. 
So I want to remind our listening audience that the play, Are You Now or Have You Ever Been, will be here at Middlesex Community College on Thursday evening, April 5th. We'll start at 6.30, and then the play itself will begin at 6.45, and there will time, be time for questions and answers afterwards. If you've not been to the campus recently, it's 100 Training Hill Road, up the hill from the Connecticut River, and if you come to our lower parking lot and stand there and look out into the valley, you'll see the Aragoni Bridge, off in the distance. Chapman Hall is our library. It's handicapped accessible. The play itself is free. Uh, we would love to have the public come here in large numbers to see this wonderful production here at the college. This has been the Middlesex Moments radio show, and I want to encourage our listeners who want to know more about the college to go to our website, which is www.mxcc.edu. I'm Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College, wishing you a good day.